All right, you're obviously from Florida. I'm not. You're much tanner. <laughs> I don't know. I may spend a, a, a large amount of time on the beach. You do? Yes, okay. I do. Are we recording? We are recording. Oh, <laughs> don't tell that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's okay. an awesome part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. How do you feel? Um, I'm feeling excited, a little bit nervous, but I'm glad to be here. We haven't met in person since 2017. It's been about half a decade. Mm -hmm. What has changed since we first met? Ooh, uh, a lot's changed. When you tell somebody that you have schizophrenia, how do you want them to react? I want them to not be afraid of me and not to look at me any differently than they had looked at me before. Do you ever go back and watch that first video we no. filmed? No, I don't. Why not? It's, it's difficult to, to see me uh, like that because I was very struggling with I was struggling with a hallucination during that interview. I remember looking at the comment section, people were like, why aren't they looking at, they can't, you know, uh, having a hard time like looking your direction. I was struggling with um, that hallucination, but also as someone who's autistic, I've also struggled with giving eye contact in general. Like I feel like I'm hyper aware of like, am I giving too much eye contact? Not enough eye contact, no, you know, cause it's like, so I was really struggling in that, uh, in that interview. How often do you hear voices? My, my uh, hallucinations are almost 24-7. Uh, it's something that I just have learned to live with. In your original video, you said that you experienced hallucinations almost 24-7. Mm. Is that still the case? So it's been a long road uh, on my schizophrenia journey. Um, for me now, I don't hallucinate 24-7 anymore, which like when we get, had our last interview, I honestly thought I was going to hallucinate 24/7 for the rest of my life. Like I had just been like, okay, this is this is my life, whatnot. Um, but now, I I do still struggle with some of my auditory hallucinations and visual hallucinations. But it's not 24/7. It's more when I'm struggling with being like stress uh, that often comes up. You went from experiencing hallucinations 24/7 to now you can go days without it. Yeah, and. Honestly, uh, like I'm very, I'm very fortunate. I know that's not the case with everyone who lives with uh, schizophrenia. I know that whatever you did to decrease your hallucinations won't work for everybody, but can you just give us the play-by-play -play of how you got to the place you are today compared to when we first met in 2017? Yeah, so when I was uh, struggling back in 2017, um, I was still figuring out the different treatment options that was right for me. Also back in 2017, and this is part of the reason I have a hard time looking back at that original interview, is I looked very different and I was also struggling with, um, I wasn't open at the time, I was also struggling with substance uh, use. I was uh, mismanaging uh, my medication. And I think that's an important topic to talk about when we're talking about people living with schizophrenia, psychosis, and talking about different treatment options is to have that good conversation, you know, with your doctor and only take your medication, you know, as prescribed the amount and when. Because um, for me, I was struggling with my medication on how it affected my sleep. And uh, when you're someone who is a student and you're also, uh, trying different uh, treatment options that's affecting your sleep, well, that's going to affect your studies as well because oftentimes I felt like, well, do I be the good patient right now, take my medication, go to sleep, whatnot, or do I be that good student, stay up, study for my test, or I was also an astrophysics student, do I stay up and do that, you know, telescope time. So I, I ended up having this unhealthy relationship of not taking my medication or taking too much of my medication and whatnot, and it was a very unhealthy relationship. Uh, so where I'm at now is I have a treatment routine that I stick to and I have that consistency. I also have um, a better support network now. I have a lot of great friends and colleagues that I lean and support on. Uh, so some of those changes both come from treatment but also come from learning different coping skills that work well for me, and also finding that support network uh, that uh, is there for me as well. And even if I don't experience some of my schizophrenia symptoms that I did 
you know, back in 2017, um, I am still someone who actively has schizophrenia. I still struggle with my hallucinations, maybe not as much, um, but I do, they, they are still something prevalent in my life. But there's also other symptoms within schizophrenia as well, not just uh, hallucinations. Uh, for right now, my struggle with, um, with my diagnosis comes more in forms of I struggle with isolation at times, I struggle with scattered thoughts, I struggle with motivation, I struggle with uh, depression, and that's become more prevalent um, with my mental health than my hallucinations are now. Why will you isolate sometimes? Ooh, um, for me, I get into this mindset that I, I don't want people to see me. I'm kind of like embarrassed of just my looks. I'm also, um, as I mentioned before, I'm autistic and I have schizophrenia, so I also stim often. Um, I'm someone who uh, I sometimes like hit my head like this, or I flap my arms and such, and I struggle with a lot of uh, internalized stigma there on just not wanting people to see, I don't even want people to see me uh, stimming. And so when I'm having days that I have a hard time passing as neurotypical, I would sometimes isolate myself. Um, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, I'm just saying that's what I struggle with. Uh, but, but now I'm getting much better at accepting myself and it's okay to stim openly, it's okay to not be masked or well, masked in like the when when you talk about masking and autism it's about uh not hiding your symptoms when do you first open up about your autism diagnosis Ooh, um maybe less than two years ago I, I have to like look back but it's been very relatively recently has accepting your autism diagnosis been part of your decrease in hallucinations quite made that comparison, but I think it definitely has helped with uh, accepting me as the person that I am. In the original video we did in 2017, you said something that I loved. I'm going to play it right here. I really will not rest until anyone who has schizophrenia anywhere worldwide is not afraid to say the words, I have schizophrenia. Are you still pursuing that goal of helping people feel comfortable and confident talking about schizophrenia and psychosis? Absolutely, and that's something that I'm going to be continuing uh, with my advocacy work and what we're doing as a team with a nonprofit Students with Psychosis. I am so uh, happy with our and proud of the progress that we've made with Students with Psychosis. Students with Psychosis is a nonprofit that empowers college students advocates worldwide through community building and collaboration. Why was it important for you to start this nonprofit? Because when I was a student uh, with schizophrenia, I had a hard time finding fellow peers. And when I went to other mental health uh, initiatives, oftentimes schizophrenia, psychosis was left out because it made people feel uncomfortable. I remember sitting down at a college club about mental health and I started opening up about some of my hallucinations and people looked at me like I was crazy. People looked at me uh, like they were kind of scared or uncomfortable. And in a way, that made it even worse because here I am in a mental health space and it made me feel even more crazy or not like I belonged. So it's important when we're talking about mental health, having initiatives on college campuses, that we are including psychosis. You brought two members of the organization, Cece and Seamus, with you today and I'm going to interview them about their life and how students with psychosis has impacted them. So Cece and Seamus, they've been part of the SWP team uh, for a while now. They're both on the executive board. And they also both wear like two different hats. They're also uh, part of volunteer staff as well. Uh, they're on the executive board and they're also both operation uh, directors. So they're very involved behind the scenes. Prior to students with psychosis, I, at least for the most part, uh, wouldn't have dared tell anyone anything that I was experiencing. I wouldn't reach out for help. I wouldn't even, you know, I was really going through it and ask for a hug and nothing. Um, I just didn't want to um, put myself through any, any complications that might arise from having to tell someone. And in having that support with students with psychosis, um, like recently I told one of my coworkers uh, about my experience and it was just kind of, we were just talking back and forth and they were actually like very accepting. Um, I, I get a lot more nice surprises like that that 
come with taking risks that I don't feel like I would have had the, uh, uh, I would have been too afraid before students with psychosis to do something like that. Tell me about yourself, Seamus. Uh, let's see. Um, what would you want to know? Do you want to know about like, like my school, my career, my symptoms, my mental illness? When I ask you to tell me about yourself, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Um, I, a student at Berkeley, uh, studying to be a guitar teacher. When I was a student, reaching out and trying to find psychosis-specific resources was a challenge. And there's so much power when it comes to uh, power in community, power in finding those uh, peers, feeling accepted. And I've honestly learned, have, have learned so much from Seamus as well, because uh, we're both fellow peers living with psychosis. I started dealing with symptoms of psychosis. Um, and when it first came on, I didn't really know what was going on. How old were you when the symptoms came on? I was about 16 or 17. Uh, at first, I had a, uh, the bipolar part of the schizoaffective disorder with the uh, bipolar type. Um, I had a depressive episode for about six months. Then that just flipped on a dime into mania. And then that kind of catapulted into hallucinations. It started kind of like background noise. And then background noise turned up into hearing voices. And then constantly hearing voices. Um, I started hallucinating more, I was hallucinating demons, and that kind of uh, led to some delusions because I thought the demons were like torturing me with the voices, and it was, um, so it was a whole thing. <laughs> Do you still experience a lot of that now? Actually, it's a lot better at this point. Um, it was really bad for I about like two or so years, and I... <sighs> I went on a big hunt to find people who were struggling with similar things, um, which is how I found Cecilia and students with schizophrenia, and students with psychosis, excuse me, that was the original name. And I just really, really dug in trying to find ways to cope. Um, and it, it, it was hard, I, I still struggle, but it did over the years get easier, thankfully. If there's somebody experiencing their symptoms in silence, afraid to speak out, what would you say to them? First, I want to say that it's okay to not have to share everything. Uh, I know for me, when I first uh, started opening up about uh, my schizophrenia, I thought that I had to say or tell everyone about every single hallucination or symptom that I had or whatnot. Um, but it's okay um, to only share what you feel comfortable sharing at the time. Um, and it's okay to sort of build that trust uh, with, with someone. You don't have to open up everything at once. Um, also, I want to say that people care about you. Uh, there are resources out there. I, I know for me, I don't think that I would be here today if I didn't get the proper uh, medical help, if I didn't find community members and a support network uh, to be there with me on my difficult days. So people care about you. Can you tell me about Cecilia's impact in the psychosis community? Yeah, she really is, um, she's a leader within the community. She, I think, empowers a lot of people who are feeling, it's very easy to be isolated and feel kind of you know, meek and powerless when dealing with something so intense and so isolating. Um, and she just being like loud and proud and, and getting this whole community together, I think inspires a lot of people. There's an event tonight for, with students with psychosis and I'm coming, I'm gonna film some B-roll and probably put it in this video. What is the event? I'm so excited about the event tonight. We're having our Boston meetup uh, here. We're in Boston, and some of our students and advocates in the Boston or surrounding area will be having an open mic. We'll be having a discussion. So it's going to be a really fun event. There's going to be some music. There's going to be some storytelling. There's going to be discussion. I'm really excited for you to come. I'm excited to be there. All right. So hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecilia. I am from New York City, so traveled in this morning. My pronouns are they, she. Um, my high and low, um, 
my high would definitely be here today uh, and seeing all of you. It's really amazing that we're having these in-person meetups again. Um, my low would be, uh, hmm. it's, it's hard to think of a low because today's been a good day. I guess maybe the rain, uh, just because like my hair game today, so I got a little frizzy. So there, there's that. Cool, cool. Uh, I'm Lane and I am just from right here. I am a student here at BC. Um, he, him. And a high for today is probably just this, getting to meet everyone. And I've, uh, I've connected with a lot of people online and just seeing them all in person. It's been great. I mean, I've had professionals that have helped me so much, but even with professionals, you know, they just don't live with it, uh, at least most professionals. Um, and so they'll, they'll get aspects and they'll like really try and, you know, be kind and, you know, and everything like that and compassionate, but, uh, Finding people who actually have experienced it, uh, they just get on a different level, and it um, it's relieving to be able to almost not have to explain it as much. My high is definitely this meeting. Um, feeling very energized by that. Um, my low is probably. Scattered thoughts, which is definitely one of my more uh, constant symptoms, like uh, hallucinations, delusions are kind of come and go at this point. But uh, scattered thoughts are pretty constant. But other than that, doing really well. What's your first conscious memory of having a moment of psychosis? When I was uh, around like four or five, I've had schizophrenia for all of my life. It became more prevalent my junior, senior year of high school and then snowballed into college. But five years old, I remember struggling with uh, hallucinations. Uh, there was this uh, shadowy figure that would come out of my, my closet. Uh, and my uh, parents would call it Mr. Mr. Blob Man. And I honestly, you know, don't blame them for not taking it very seriously. Like. Uh, what five-year-old isn't scared of their closet, you know, and thinks that there's like a monster in their closet. I mean, they made a Pixar movie about it. So like, I get it. But then at the same time, I wish there was more education about what is schizophrenia, what is psychosis, because I didn't hear those words until I was much older. I actually learned about the word schizophrenia from watching the TV show Criminal Minds which wasn't a good way to first learn about it. So education about schizophrenia psychosis would have been beneficial. We're going to go into the open mic portion of today's event. So we have some amazing performers. We have Rifty going to be performing. We got Kev that's going to be performing. As I said, I grew up uh, just north of Boston and I started experiencing psychotic uh, as well as depressive symptoms and uh, mania when I was about 10 years old because um, I grew up in a complicated household with various abuses and neglect going on. Um, so I would often see, I remember the very first night that I started seeing and hearing things. It came in a, a big wave of sound and, and fury and, um, and I, I began seeing uh, shadowy people and demons when I would open doors. I always knew there was a demon behind the door. and. Um, started hearing people talking to me in derogatory ways, um, telling me I wasn't good enough, smart enough, and people didn't like me. Um, and my life, uh, when, when I was 13, I advocated for myself and told my parents and my school that I needed help. And I didn't tell them I was seeing or hearing anything, I just told them that I was going crazy. and, and um, I never actually told anyone that I saw or heard things until I was 35. What advice do you have for support units, families of people with schizophrenia? I would say uh, my advice to someone who uh, is supporting a loved one is to be patient uh, with that loved one. Also, uh, sitting down and listening uh, to them. I think that oftentimes uh, when it comes to uh, experiencing a schizophrenia or psychosis, we're told like what to do or how to think about um, our experience. So it's important to listen to the individual um, and listen to their needs. My life from uh, age 13 um, and beyond went from psych units to foster care 
and then uh, high school dropout, homeless, and um, and then I just bounced around homeless, and I joined the army, bounced around the country a little bit, and um, in and out of shelters. Didn't know I had. I thought I was just had depression. That's what the, they told me when I was a kid. You have depression, and you're having trouble adjusting to adolescence. Um, so I just thought I was a bad person and I was made wrong. Um, diagnosis came when I was 35. I was a single father with full custody of a four-year-old, uh, living in a shelter, and I was shoplifting regularly for our food, and I got caught. And the courts saw that there was something going on, something more. And they helped me get into a hospital and get a correct diagnosis. I think that when people think of the word schizophrenia, think of the word of uh, psychosis, they don't think of a community of people um, as much as individuals or a diagnosis. They don't think of, say, like a team working effectively together or faces of leadership and such. And by working with people with schizophrenia and psychosis, I've seen that we can work together well as a team. You know, you can you know have different leadership styles and such uh, with schizophrenia and psychosis, and that also we bring different perspectives to the table as well. There's been positive things through my schizophrenia and psychosis. For example, I think I'm a better problem solver than I was before I struggled more with my schizophrenia. Because if you question reality every single day, well, that's going to make you look at the world a little bit differently. And so this song that I'm going to play for you, the first song, uh, is called Good Morning Psychosis. And it gives an idea of what I wake up to in the morning when I first come to consciousness. Um, this is what's going through my head. And then I work through it, you know. In recovery, I've learned to get up a little earlier to work through these feelings. But this is called Good Morning Psychosis. Comments are constant, racing, repeating. Consistent and careless, combative, misleading, defeating the grandiose plans I'm creating. Collecting debris, protecting and reflecting, and I know they are listening with sneaking suspicion. They hear all I say, and it keeps me from speaking, so lock me away as an act of contrition. This madness is hatching without safety restrictions. Volunteer to the dark where the demons wait patient to make me their mark Well, they're careless with death and they swallow your soul And it plays itself out and keeps me less than whole And the shadows keep watching and silently waiting They shroud me in darkness, they keep pulling and baiting Motionless and baseless, they plot and conspire Drawn from the youth where they first lit the fire What's the difference between a delusion and a hallucination. Yeah, so a hallucination, think of it more of something like sensory, so uh, seeing something that isn't there, uh, hearing something that isn't there, smelling something that isn't there, tasting something that isn't there, and a delusion is more of like a false belief, um, so believing in something that um, isn't uh, accepted by like the social norm around you. Uh, an exclusion would be like, you know, a little kid could believe in like Santa Claus. That's not a delusion because people around them, you know, are, are telling them that it's not real and whatnot. But like a delusion, uh, an example sort of cliche is thinking like uh, the FBI is after you or that you're being uh, followed or whatnot. Um, but then when talking about delusions or talking about paranoia, I think it's important uh, to also address that sometimes someone can experience uh, paranoia and also uh, experience a delusion and we need to uh, listen to the individual uh, patiently and with compassion um, because oftentimes people living with schizophrenia or psychosis are discredited um, or are not uh, taken as seriously because 
they experience delusions or paranoia. Um, for example, uh, oftentimes our ambitions are seen as delusions of grandeur. When I talked about moving, because uh, when we last had our, uh, our interview, I still lived at uh, Penn State. I wanted to move to New York City, start the nonprofit Students with Psychosis. And I remember sitting in a psych ward af after our video um, with my doctor and another doctor or a nurse. And they were asking me very personal questions about like finances. They were asking me about how are you going to do this? Who are you talking with? This and the other thing. And they were treating my whole wanting to move to New York City, starting the nonprofit Students with Psychosis as this delusion of grandeur and this big delusion and these people I was talking with or networking with as a delusion. And what message I want to get across is you can be someone with schizophrenia, you could have psychosis and have hopes and dreams. We're people too. Um, and I think that a lot of our community just isn't taken as seriously when it comes to our ambitions and also uh, sometimes our, even our own valid fears are also diminished because uh, it gets labeled as paranoia or a delusion. What is that like when you're sharing your hopes and dreams of improving and connecting the psychosis community and somebody writes it off as a delusion? It's disappointing. Um, it makes me feel less of a person. It makes me feel that my voice matters less. Well, they argue and argue all day in my head and I lose the intrusive thoughts left unsaid then they hear me, they hear me, manipulate and steer me. They question my purpose and won't leave me be. Resistant, non-compliant, fight, freeze or flight and they know what I'm thinking and it's all black and white and they argue and argue. But the points are all mute, and the resulting waves is short, but acute. What I find, uh, maybe scary is the right word, is that somebody can call your dreams a delusion, and what happens if you pursue your dreams and things didn't go as they went? What if they just oh didn't goodness. work out? Well, do you think that you're delusional and not pursue your dreams anymore? You are talking about one of like something that's it's like that bugs me a lot because say if uh, students with schizophrenia was a flop, say that it didn't work out. Luckily it did, but say that it didn't. Where people just thought I was a, a delusional person with schizophrenia. But when you look at entrepreneurs and stuff, how many failed business ideas are there? You know, neurotypical people t doing business ideas that fail and such. You know, and I think that people living with psychosis maybe aren't given that same grace um, to make mistakes or people don't have that uh, level of confidence with them. So luckily, you know, things worked out. We have a beautiful uh, community. Our nonprofit is doing well. But yeah, that's a very valid concern of mine was I'm going all in on this nonprofit. And if it fails, am I going to be labeled as that delusional person with schizophrenia that moved, uh, moved to New York City? Hi, my name is Cecilia. Uh, friends call me Cece, she, her, and I uh, came in today from Atlantic City area of New Jersey. Tell me about Cece's role in students with psychosis. Yeah, so Cece serves on our executive board. Uh, they also wear a hat on our uh, staff as well on, as an operations director. So CC helps on the executive board and also on staff and helps oversee our programming to make sure it runs smoothly. How did you first get involved with SWP? Well, I found out about SWP through a um, YouTube spiral where I was just going in video after video after video and I was looking up schizophrenia um, and different organizations and support groups related to it and I stumbled across Cecilia's TED Talk and it just flourished from there. What caused you to research schizophrenia on YouTube? Well, I'm diagnosed as schizoaffective, so I was looking for people with like minds. What was it like when you saw Cecilia's video? Oh, it was, it was amazing. It was like this, like I found this amazing uh, treasure that I could open up and utilize and it was like, it felt very custom for me. It was, it was really great to, um, to see that there was a community of people with like minds because, you know, growing up in the 90s, there, there definitely wasn't a support group or really conversation about psychosis and schizophrenia. When you have a whole organization and every member is diagnosed with psychosis, do you have to provide any accommodations? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's something that students with psychosis is modeling on how do you have a workplace that is not only supportive but empowering to people living with psychosis. So ways that we make our our workplace empowering and supportive is we have very flexible deadlines. Uh, we also take a very team community approach to things. So, and also we make sure that we're checking in on people's mental health. For example, on our work chat, we have a temperature check where uh, a, someone behind the scenes can let us know if they wanna go on a mental health break, if they need some additional help or support or they're back from a mental health break. So it's important that we're checking in on our team members. I'm Josh, I use uh, he, him, his pronouns and uh, a little bit nervous, not gonna lie. But I will say uh, my high is that uh, I saw my grandparents in um, Runs With Maine. Josh, how long have you been involved with students with psychosis? I've been involved for about a year and a half and I love it and it's really cool because I, Cecilia who's the head of Students with Psychosis, the, the leader, I had seen her on YouTube before and I thought to myself, wow, um, that's amazing what she's doing, I'll never meet her. And then here we are today and I, and I met her and I've met her and it's, it's been an amazing experience. What is it like for you when you see somebody who came into your organization make positive changes in their life? I am so freaking proud of every single person part of uh, Students with Psychosis and it's honestly such a privilege getting to uh, meet someone when they first join SWP. A lot of our uh, community members have been part of SWP for uh, a couple years or more and it's amazing seeing their growth. Uh, whether it's like with academics or person level, but also there's sometimes even their comfortability about talking about psychosis. Outside of finding the treatment plan that works for you, what else have you done to get to where you are today? For me, it's been also a lot of acceptance of being a person living with schizophrenia, being autistic, accepting myself as the person that I am. I can see it in you. Like you have this, this acceptance, this air of acceptance that I love to see that makes me happy that definitely wasn't there in 2017. I agree because at that time I was embarrassed about uh, having schizophrenia and now it's like if people don't accept me for having schizophrenia or being autistic, it's their problem, you know? Um, and a lot of what's given me this confidence was finding fellow peers, fellow people living with psychosis, and really being proud of the community that we are. Being with a bunch of people uh, who have experienced psychosis and have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, anxiety, depression, additionally to a lot of these disorders has really helped me um, feel like I'm not alone and that there are other people uh, like me and we're normal. What advice would you have to somebody who's in a similar place to where you were when we first met? Don't give up on yourself. Um, if anything that I've learned about uh, the future is that, you know, whatever you think the future is going to be, it's probably not going to be that. Um, and so don't get caught up in uh, signing yourself off on something. Like, uh, for me, I'm glad that I didn't give up on myself. I'm glad that when people thought that starting the nonprofit Students with Psychosis was a delusion or whatnot, I'm glad that I didn't believe them. I'm glad that I didn't let their words of discouragement slow me down. Uh, so my advice is be patient with yourself and don't give up on yourself.